Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. We're so glad to be here today to talk scripture. And we want to open the word of the Lord today. It's such a blessing to, to be a part of God's family and to be a part of what God is doing in this time. I'm excited about the move of the Holy Ghost and uh, everything that God is doing now. And we're going to see the fruit of it later. Um, I wanted to bring you a little uh, Bible study today. I want to talk uh, about communion, but before we get into communion, I, I just want to address the concept of uh, redemption because it's part communion is part of redemption. In Christianity, everything has a historical base. The things that we do are not abstract ideas or eph uh, ephemeral concepts. Our ceremonies, rituals, even beliefs have grown out of the rich soil of history. This is no less true of redemption itself. Redemption is our history incorporated into God's history. It is the intersect of our history meeting his history. Or stated another way, it's when what we have done meets what he has done. I like to look at it that way. God in his wisdom set a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was the divine deposit that provided unlimited purchasing power to cleanse every sin, cover every shame, and restore every lost sheep. God, and this is important because God, we need to understand this. God does not fix things. He redeems them. God is not a handyman that simply restores things to their former working condition and then walks away. Well, that's done. What else can be fixed? No, the almighty redeems things going beyond repair and makes them greater than they were before. His redemption repurposes the object of his affection to surpass even the object's wildest dreams. The Lord opens blind eyes and unstops the ears of the deaf, but he also causes the lame man to leap as in heart and the tongue of the dumb to sing. In other words, he makes them greater and better than they were before. Redemption means to buy at the market. So when the Lord delivers us, he is perching us out of the slavery of sin when we then are healed to serve his grand plan. Redemption, part of redemption is belonging. Um, think about this. We all desire to belong. I think one of the hardest things about uh, our present situation is being in isolation. When we know we belong with, uh, you know, fellowship and being with each other and celebrating uh, as the body of Christ. Um, we, specific, we, we all desire to belong. We specifically uh, desire to belong to something bigger than us something meaningful because we want our lives to matter. Our very identity is tied up into what we belong to or with whom we share the road. Many people are connected to groups that are destructive simply because they want to belong or they did not know that there was a group or cause that would satisfy that hunger in their souls. The problem with belonging to the wrong thing is you lose yourself. Belonging to the right thing is to find yourself and your identity. Let me communicate something, rather someone that we can all identify with, and that's Christ. We're talking about communion. We must take a moment and explain the communion and why it matters to each of us and to the body of Christ. Like every spiritual treasure, there is a very rich context. Our starts with the Jewish Passover. The Passover, the first day of the, it was the first day of unleavened bread when the disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 26 and they asked him, where should we prepare the Passover feast? He told them to go into the city where they'd find a man carrying a pitcher and tell that man that he would, he would celebrate the Passover at his place. Uh, and so little did they know that Christ would take, he would celebrate the Passover, but little did they know that he would take the Passover and elevate it and transition it into a table of grace. The Passover was and still is one of the most sacred ceremonies in Jewish life. It was a home gathering commemoration of Israel's release from Egyptian bondage. The heart of the Exodus and God's deliverance was commemorated by the entire Jewish family sitting down at a table and feasting on the Passover lamb. Jesus said that he would keep the Passover, but he did much more than that. As the Lord incarnate, he took the sacred event and redesigned it for a grander, more glorious purpose. While I was thinking about teaching this, I, I began to think about the Passover and what it represented, what it stood for. 
Uh, I know it was remembrance of a nation that was formulated and created out of bondage. Lambs were slain. The blood was displayed on the doorpost and the lintel in every believer's home. As part of the ceremony, each person dressed for travel with their shoes on and their staffs in their hand. They closed the doors and started the feast of the lamb, unleavened bread and bitter herbs to remind them of where they'd come from. They were glorifying God for their deliverance. Their deliverance and their identity was wrapped up in the Exodus. It still is. So the identity of being Jewish is tied up with the whole, we were formulated, we were created out of this situation. But the orientation of the feast was in the past and ending with where we are today. Um, Let's talk about the past for a minute. The past, like nitroglycerin, must be dealt with very carefully. Rabbinical teachings say that there are at least two ways to deal with the past incorrectly. The first is quite common when a person is oppressed and then finally they get the upper hand. They, they, be, they become the oppressor. That's one way of dealing with it. So, so psychologically, now you have the hammer and you're going to make that person pay for what they've done to you. A second way, which is also common of dealing with the past, is to try to shut it out of your mind and, 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 and put it back to where you're not thinking about it anymore. Uh, but one thing that's beautiful about the Jewish Passover and the celebration, they take the past, they take that painful past, and they talk about not, not so much the, they, they do, they talk about the pain and the suffering and the bitterness of all of that situation, but they, they bring it into worship. They bring it into worshiping the Lord. The beautiful thing about that is what a great lesson we can learn from uh, the Jewish keeping of the Passover that we take our past and we make it, we make it serve the Lord. Amen. Um, what if we did that? What if we, what if we was to, what if we was to take our past and make it serve the Lord? What if we was to say, well, you know, that, that part of me before I knew the Lord, that part of me that was unredeemed, that part of me that was in sin life before I found God, uh, is that going to be, it, it, it is a source of shame, but let's, let's change the orientation of that to, it was where I learned what not to do. It was where I learned what to stay away from. It was where I learned that there was more to life than just sin and the things that sin offered and the things that the world offered. If I was to take that past and make it serve God, I think that would be a good lesson to learn from the Passover. Making your past serve the Lord is an acquired skill and uh, is something that we have to practice at, but I, I think it's, it's doable. When you look at the communion, um, Jesus in Matthew 26, and I believe it's uh, Mark 12 and then Luke 22, all address the Passover meal. Um, the meal has changed. Uh, we, we call it, the, it's often called the Last Supper. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted it. The scene is etched into our minds. Christ is in the center of the table, surrounded by all of his disciples. He picked up a loaf. He took bread, blessed, and broke it. Take, eat, this is my body. Paul in 1 Corinthians continues the thought, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When we take unleavened bread for communion, we are acknowledging how his body was broken for us. Then he picks up the cup, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It's a new covenant in his blood. And when we drink the fruit of the vine, we acknowledge that his blood was shed for us. Blood that would bring in a new covenant. 1 Corinthians 11 and 26 is beautiful because it captures the essence so well. Paul, Paul reiterates this when he says, for as often as you eat this bread, present tense, and drink this cup, present tense. You proclaim the Lord's death past till he comes, future. So the beautiful thing about communion is, is the communion supper extends the Passover to not only cover the past, but the present and even the future. Jesus captures all three dimensions of time and the three communion and, and the communion reshapes those dimensions of time to focus on him. I love this. 
When we partake of his body and blood in remembrance of him, we're not focused on our past, but on the cross and his suffering. The past we acknowledge is not pitying ourselves for our hardships. It's recalling that his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. In the present, we sit down at the table of grace to commune with his, un, with his unleavened body in the form of unleavened bread. The Passover was baptized into grace. If we reflect on the Passover here, the lamb was to be eaten for strength, strength to travel when deliverance moved them out of Egypt. The symbol also nourishes us to do the work set before us. Our work of evangelism that God has called us to, we find strength and nourishment in communion when we sit at the table of grace. We take his blood as it presently cleanses us, enlivens our spirits, protects us. The blood of the lamb is taken off the doorpost and lintels and applied to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This enables us to plead the blood. And this is why, this is why we have, it, it becomes a nourishment, it becomes a cleansing, it becomes even a spiritual weapon that protects the people of God. When we plead the blood, how often I've heard old timers use the expression, and I'll be honest with you, for a long time, I didn't understand quite what they were trying to do. But then you realize pleading the blood is what the church should do on a constant basis because we're a people of victory. We're an overcoming people. We're a people that, that, that know how to get things done in the spirit. And I thank God for that. But let's not forget also that communion also moves us into the future. Because his blood is overcoming blood, we are empowered to face any future foe or obstacle. The blood uh, revelation talks about the saints who overcome the dragon by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The resurrected Christ has a resurrected body. The body that was once broken has become immortal. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 118. He is immortal and thus invincible. No serpent will sink his fangs into the feet of brass. That's one of the things I love about the, the designation of Christ in Revelation chapter one. In his resurrected form, he has feet of brass. It was prophesied in Genesis 3.15 that the serpent would strike his heel but then he would crush his head. But after the resurrection, Christ is depicted as having feet of brass. There's no serpent going to bite that foot. Amen. And, and he is um, never going to be humiliated ever again. He's going to be the conqueror. Let's wrap this up. He also says, Paul, I like how Paul captures the future in the communion by the phrase, till I come. The most important thing for us to know about the future. Our future is he's coming again as Christians. And I, and, and, I, and I appeal to you as Christians, we should anticipate the empowering that comes from taking communion. Um, if you think about communion, for somebody that's not allowed communion, we use the term excommunicate. And that means that you're set apart from the communion. Well, if you're not a partaker of the communion, you can actually excommunicate yourself. So what I'm appealing for you is when it comes time for communion, communicate yourself. Jump in, be a part of what God has done for your past, for your present, for your future. As Christians, we should anticipate the empowering that comes from taking communion. It restores, refreshes, renews us in the spirit. And we have a new identity in Christ. Communion reclaims, refreshes, and renews us. So when it comes to communion, come and join us at the table of grace. Abundant Life Church, a place of new beginnings. It's a great place. If you don't have a church home, it's a great place to come. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name.